afternoon, everybody, or good morning, wherever you're at. This is Guillermo Salvatier, your host for today's uh, Perspectives on Energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. And, and gracing us today, and a great pleasure to have him as a guest, is the one and only Jay Fidel. Welcome, Jay. Thank you very much, Guillermo. Today, we're going to be discussing, and this is really a, um, a review on some of an earlier episode we had on power system fundamentals. Where we were discussing the uh, some of the uh, the basics of uh, how a power system or a grid works, and what are some of the challenges we're facing now. I'm sure some of you may know we've got ourselves a little bit of a heat wave in the mainland, where some of the different regions, some of the utilities have been experiencing um, issues with their capacity. What does that mean? And capacity issues, and basically means that you know you may not have enough power to supply your demand. And if things get bad enough, you may have to engage in what they call um, load reduction methods, whether you're shutting off people's air conditioners or you're shutting off, for example, power altogether, or you do rotating rotating blackouts, right? So, but there's usually uh, conditions that lead up to this, right? Uh, aside from the fact that forget about the rotational inertia and the ability to, to be able to survive like a, an outage. Uh, really what it is is that slow creeping march into that peak of the day. We got a lot of generators and those generators have a lot of mass that spins usually as copper, iron, magnets, that sort of thing. And, and those are spinning at 60 Hertz, which is why in Florida and the US, we have a 60 Hertz uh, frequency. You go to parts of Europe or the Middle East, there's 50 Hertz. The reason being is that those units are spinning at 50 cycles per second. Here we spin at 60 cycles per second. So all of that uh, spinning around is a lot of rotational inertia. And for the longest time, the majority of our generation was comprised of these like uh, large, heavy machines with a lot of mass. And the reason being is that, is that that was that was the design of the time. And that whole system was designed around uh, surviving, for example, uh, disturbances or a fault because there's so much inertia in the system, it could handle those, those particular losses without being jarred around too much. Now things are changing a little bit, right? You you see more of a diverse source of generation. You got some solar, some batteries. You got a lot of like, you still have a lot of like uh, traditional type of generators that have a lot of inertia in them to spin around. But as you as you inject more of these inverter based resources, which is ba and which is basically it's DC power coming out of either wind or coming out of like the solar sites, that's artificially converted over to an AC signal with the help of very, power, very, very strong power electronics, you're getting a very clean AC signal at 60 hertz. Problem with those uh, is that, and the same thing with batteries, right? All of that has to go through an inverter. And I'm sure all of you have used an inverter, right? You basically have plug it into your cigarette lighter in your car. And at the other end, you have a nice 120 volts AC, 60 hertz source that you can plug in your laptop charger, hopefully not a hairdryer, right? So, so this uh, you and I both have no use for that, but I'm sure some people do. I don't have the problem with the hair dryer. <laughs> so, so with these inverter-based resources at the utility scale, right? Uh, what happens with them is that, and for a while, they were not they were not very good at being able to withstand uh, disturbances in the system. They would either stop putting output, stop supplying. They were, they were completely shut off. So to the point that that uh, the regulating bodies had to issue new rules when it came to riding through disturbances, which now puts a manufacturer and even the utilities that actually are responsible for these devices, you know, at a little bit more of a risk because some of the manufacturers don't want to warrant, you know, damages caused by that. And the utilities have to do a little bit more maintenance and take a larger share of risk. Now, fast forward, and we're already at a stage where that technology has really, really improved, and it's gotten a lot more reliable. And it, that would have been great if we didn't have so many of them on the grid, right? And the problem with that is that once you get to that point where you have that, that you get close to what they call that critical mass or that knee, the reliability knee, renewables knee, they call it, you are not likely to survive uh, a significant outage, right, for, if it happens. And that's where most of the industry is getting concerned with, right? So it gets to the point where maybe there's different settings need to be looked at, or maybe you need to maintain a certain a certain percentage of the generation that still has a lot of rotational mass or inertia, right? So the other issue we have too is that you know tr traditionally, right? That's what it looks like, and this is a regulated environment, right? And you go from the source, which is generation, and that could mean typical power plants and nuclear. It can be natural gas. It could be solar. It could be wind. 
Eventually, that's, that goes into the transmission system through these transformers, and there it's, it's transmitted across the system, and then eventually it goes into distribution where it distributes it across to the, you know, the, the consumers and the end users. And that's a very simplified diagram of what that looks like, broken up into three different sections, right? This generation, transmission, and distribution. That would be like a good cross-section of what the grid would look like. You have many, many generating stations. You have many, many networks and layers of transmission lines. You have many, many uh, step-down transformers, and you have a really wide grid of like uh, of uh, consumers, whether it's industrial, commercial, or basically your good old residential consumer, right? That's the way it's always been traditionally, but that's changed. If we go to the next slide, you also see how th this is all evolving, right? Where in the in, you know, on the left, when I say present, like what's I I'll say it's the past, and now we're looking at more. What, what says future here, that's more like where we're at now, with a lot more resources, right, that are that are peppered in there all over the grid as inverter-based resources, which is great. It's great for climate change. It's great for um, overall the cost per megawatts that are generated. Once you consider the sunk cost of actually putting that in service, and you quantify that. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it adds to the whole portfolio diversity. Problem is, if you go to the next slide, these areas, like for example, California and all the others on WEC, you have Texas on their own, then you have the Eastern interconnection made up of those five different colors. Those areas on their own, they are all interconnected and they support each other with voltage and frequency. Right? So for example, if a unit down at the FRCC loses a, a large generator, everybody through CERC, RFC, and all those other, all those other regions can actually supply power through the transmission lines to make up for that loss. Same thing happens in WEC. In fact, California has a lot of transmission lines connecting it to Oregon and Nevada and New Mexico, even, even Mexico, and importing a lot of power into their system. Right? So they get a lot of power in. ERCOT, for example, is, is pretty much on their own as Texas, right? But again, it's such a big state that they have a lot of their own resources. But the problem is that most of these, these three different um, regions do not connect uh synchronously they have dc tie connections so they can move power back and forth similarly to what you see out of those inverter-based resources but this is more of a transmission scale so they're very limited into what they can send back and forth and they cannot support each other with voltage or frequency so pretty much each of the three regions is pretty much on their own this is actually a, a diagram indicating for example very simple thing, but what it is is the buying and selling of power between different entities or different regions. And the whole thing here is that everything has to balance out. So each one of those three regions has a very simplified version of what's happening here, right? So a lot of these power companies or these regions buy and sell power from each other. They schedule it. California does a lot of it. They buy a lot of power from these renewable resources outside of the state, and they bring that in to supply it themselves. And that's part of the challenge there, because what they'll do is they'll shut down a lot of their conventional generation and there'll be almost half renewable resources, which is great for emissions, but it presents a problem when you have uh, a disturbance. And I'll show that in the next few slides, right? So slide nine, the next one is kind of an analogy, right? So think of it as uh, traveling up, up a hill and each car, each one of the cars here is a generator and all the generators are tied together with these strong rubber bands. As long as they're all putting the same direction, there's not a lot of tension on the rubber bands. But as soon as one of them begins to stall or have an issue, the other ones have to make up the slack and pull harder. But you gotta remember these rubber bands are elastic. So they have a little bit of give, but if they if you pull too, too, too long, eventually that band might snap and you have a collapse and, and potentially a black. So that's kind of what this looks like, an analogy. The only challenge here that solar or inverter-based resources do not really add to this inertia or to this reliability aspect of these like interconnected systems. Mind you, once they, uh, they're they due for some updates on the general protocols about how these inverter-based resources react to grid disturbances, but for now, by the time they've done that, there'll be so many already in the system that we may find ourselves with a whole new different problem right, in this regard. And this is another example of what happens in a typical generator that has like a spinning inertia, right? In this case, uh, when you have, when they're all balanced, they're all basically, basically the same angle, same frequency, they're supplying whatever they're supplying at, at the same, 
basically it's interfacing well with the rest of the grid. When you have a problem with, and that's balanced, when you have an unbalanced, you're now looking at a problem where uh, one generator is probably spinning a little faster than the other, which means that they're not providing the correct amount of power like they should be. And you're getting all kinds of uh, frequency issues. And that in, in the end may lead to instability. And it's, it's one of the actual uh, steps towards you know walking into a blackout situation. So the next slide shows us what a typical load curve looks like, very generic, right? And it shows you in this case, for example, um, the, the different types of units. I say unit one is all nuclear, right? Unit two is like a very large, uh, fossil fuel type, type of plant that's very hard to dispatch. It burns a lot of natural gas, but it's really, really big. Unit three is probably the same way, but if you notice how the, the curve in blue versus the curve in green, right? The curve in blue is usually, for example, the, when they say demand, it's usually what is being consumed real time, right? And that's across maybe in this case, across 24 hours, right? They're breaking it down into like, you know, two, two four, six, 10, noon a.m. and then and then the rest of the day right so this is this was a typical load curve you know when you notice for example at 8 a.m 10 at 10, 10 a.m then for example it begins to drop down because you're getting a lot of input from the solar resources which is great because then you can back down these generators but this is an old curve nowadays that curve dies a lot deeper to the point where you're having to shut down unit four unit three Sometimes unit two, and in some cases, unit one is being dispatched the next day, which is the nuclear plants. And that's happening somewhere in the Midwest already. The units five, six, and seven are units that are basically, um, they're turned on and turned off on demand. Very expensive units, right? So the further, the lower you are on, on this scale, the less expensive you are to operate once you're online, but very expensive to move or actually cycle off or shut off and bring back online. So with these different curves, you notice how uh, you have certain units that are dispatchable a lot more easily, which is really the term here. But as you get further and further into this, you know, that curve and you dip down into units three, two, and one, now you have an issue with, with not just cost, but also reliability. Because at some point in the day when the sun sets, you have to, that, that, that curve gets back up there again. And I'll illustrate that further in the next slide here. So, oh, by the way, it is an example of how system inertia has been declining over the last few years, right? And and what it looks like over, over, over where it's trending, for example, long term and short term. Now, short term, they brought some more generation back in 2015, but that's still once again uh, still trending down when it comes to system inertia. And th that's just one of the regions, not the WAC and not ERCA. So we are gen generally experiencing a problem, right, when it comes to to, to losing that system energy. This is this was shot at oh, closer to noon today. And this is basically California, Cal ISO, right? And they were showing us, for example, what their capacity was and what their demand was in this graph. And they, and they were showing us that they currently have, they're good for about 55,000 megawatts. They're currently supplying 32,000 megawatts, right? Off to the right. And the forecast says 37,000. So they're, they're should, they should be in good shape, right? And, and in that case, when it comes to like be, being able to supply their load, and today was a pretty mild day for them. Uh, for a week ago, for them, that wasn't the case. They 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 had a lot of a lot more fossil fuel units running. Almost half of their portfolio was running on fossil fuel. So, and also you notice, you see how on the graph on the left, they have a uh, really important things here. The green is current demand. The little red and black uh, hash mark there shows includes reserves. Now those reserves is something you must have in case you lose, in case something horrible happens. Meaning, usually that means the loss of your largest asset or the loss of your, the term there is called most severe single contingency. So for them, their biggest generator could possibly be 2,800 megawatts. And they need to be ready at any time to be able to like survive that if, if that should happen at any, which is why they have to carry those reserves at all times, right? And the other stuff in black, we notice that little subscript says available the next one to two, four hours, one to four hours, which means that it may take one hour to bring that generation online. It may take as much as four hours to bring some of that generation online. What I'm getting at here is that if you have significant losses and you lose that 2,800 megawatts in, in one moment, you should survive. But... If the trend keeps going a certain way and the low keeps climbing, that that margin may not be there, 
or worse, it, it requires a lot of planning. So eventually you may actually run out of those quick start resources and then have the need to actually bring on more generation that you need just to be able to survive one of those, one of those like incidents. So in this case, you're noticing how green and blue, right? And we're looking at, for example, what it looks like. Um, it's the one at the bottom. So you, you're, you're looking to see what happens when there's demand, right? That's how much is being consumed. But then you're looking at that blue curve underneath there, right? And that's what's being generated by your resources. So just remember, not only does a utility have solar, all the customers out there have distributed energy resources. They got rooftop solar, which is great for the customer, but that's forcing the utility to, to roll back and shut down their generation. Roll, rolls it back so much that they may have to shut down a lot of their own generators and then put them back on in a real hurry at around hours 15, 16, and 17 to be able to meet that, you know, afternoon demand. Problem is if you lose any generation during that time, you're you may have a really hard time providing the the, the recovery resources at that period. Right. So that one there, right? So th this is today. And today if you notice the current supply, they were at 62% renewables, nice and green. That's California. That was at around noon, right? And natural gas over there, like that, that that brown, reddish rust color was 20% 20, 20 of their portfolio. Blue was large hydro. Imports, you notice, was like the dark purple. That was like, like around 5.8%. Then they had nuclear at 7%. That's probably Diablo Canyon. It's the only one they've got, unless they're importing something from out of state. But that is a very large amount of renewables. When I looked at this uh, last week, it was the other way around. It was green, was very small, and then the uh, natural gas was more than half of what they were supplying. So for them, for example, the conditions were different. They were, may not have been having a lot of sun. They were having fires. Remember that. So that may have been maybe may have been impacting that. So that that changes throughout the day. In this case, they are at their ideal low carbon emissions type of like uh, dispatch, but that can change from one day to the next. When you look at them and when it comes to renewables over there on the bottom right, you see their solar was at 85%, but really wind, you're not getting a lot of wind, not, not much geothermal, and, and pretty much the rest of them are all tiny compared to the solar. Solar is really the bulk of what they have when it comes to renewable resources. Right? You're gonna notice all the renewables right at six, seven, eight a.m., it, they just go up, and that's mostly solar, as you can see there. And the sun comes up, and that was between eleven and right, right before noon, right, and that, that when that was taken today. And, and that shows you what happens, right? So that solar comes up, all these other resources have to back down. Luckily for them, they got some batteries down there, and you can see where they go below zero in in the negative realm. They're actually charging, which is ideally how you would want that system to work, right? And hopefully, they're, they're pretty soon they're going to have enough of those battery resources to be able to handle, for example, those four, five, six hours. Because if you notice, right, once you get beyond hour 17, you still have to be able to survive the rest of the night, right, with that. And hopefully, there's enough battery storage on there, and hopefully, you have enough resources. But in, there's always natural gas that they're using, right, to offset any kind of, like, disturbances or any kind of, like, out-of-plan type of issue. My concern is eventually that natural gas, you see that it's getting closer and closer to zero. And you also notice that the imports, which is like a dark purple view, it's also getting closer and closer to um, to, to zero. I mean, it, it's almost down to like, like 2000. So eventually, right, for me, my concern there is that you're going to be running almost entirely on like, on like batteries and inverter-based resources, and you may not be able to survive a pretty significant uh, disturbance. And what is a disturbance? It can be an example. It can be, for example, something impacts one of those large transmission lines, which happens all the time, right? Line relays out, and then now you're losing a lot of resources and they don't they be able to survive. My other concern is in a system-wide blackout, a lot of these like uh, inverter-based resources are not really useful or they're not yet designed to be able to, to get you started off when they call a black start, meaning, they're not used to um, to start the system from a from a blackout. Normally, that's hydro. What they do here, or, or like a small combustion turbine. So, what does that mean to me, and what does that mean to us in a system, right? So, this week they're fine, but last week they were issuing flex flex alerts, right? Which means they were encouraging people to like not consume so much power. I think they had issued a, a energy emergency alert level two which was they have everything they've got running they they have bought everything they can buy and they are 
they're they're eating into their reserves, meaning that they may not be able to survive uh, the loss of the most severe contingency without shutting off cost customers. And that that went on for like you know part, part of a day last week. I don't remember when exactly. But the problem is that eventually, right, as that green curve gets higher and higher, and you and you force down that 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 rust colored curve, you're losing more and more inertia, and that's where the concern is when it comes to like grid reliability. If they have enough batteries out there, which I think that's where where they're going, that's great. But they still cannot survive a line fault like the old inertia machines could. So that's where I have my little concerns when it comes. Batteries. Um... Where are the batteries from? Who's making the batteries? We're going to need more going forward. Where are we going yeah. to get them? They're they're coming in from all over the place. I mean, the in fact, I had a guest on here once from ESS Energy Storage Systems, and they're they're being made domestically, and they're very simple chemistry. They're like uh, iron salt chemistry, which is iron, water, salt, and some other ingredients. I forgot what it was, um, but they were modular. They were expandable. And then when you're in a utility, you don't need lithium because lithium really is for cars or, or vehicles. You, you want to you limit size. You want to limit weight. Uh, this, these uh, Something stationary like uh, utility scale batteries, you don't care how much it weighs. You don't really care how big it's going to be. right? So that's why you can go with the whole uh, iron sodium uh, type of batteries. There's a few others out there, but uh, um, and they have different applications. There's, there, there are some lithium batteries. A lot of them are being made domestically. So let me let me be uh, paranoid with you, Guillermo, because <clears throat> we are so completely dependent on our electrical appliances and you know communications and mm -hmm. everything. Everything in our lives requires yeah. electricity. Everything, and so you know when you are stressing the system the way we are with air conditioning to deal with the the heat. And knowing that the heat will get worse because climate mm -hmm. change is getting worse. And if you, if you look at global efforts to reduce greenhouse gases and all that and to stop climate change from happening, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, th these efforts are minuscule compared to the, mm -hmm. the need to deal with it. We're not dealing with it. I say we, I mean the whole world, not just the U.S., but especially the U.S. So yeah, what's, what's know, happening right? is we're having greater climate change. We're having greater stress on the system because of the heat. We're having people really need to have air conditioning to survive. You saw all the people recently who died already um, because because of the heat here and everywhere. Um, and so, um, you know, is this is the system capable of handling this as it gets worse? Can the utility companies and all those uh, suppliers, um, can they provide sufficient power to run an ever-increasing air conditioning structure? And that's a really good question, and I'm going to answer that in two parts. So when it comes to supply, yes, there's enough generation to supply in the in the short term, and then long term, basically, it's a matter of building more building more plants. But the problem is, you cannot supply the whole grid just by solar. You got to have enough batteries, and then. It's going to get to the point where batteries, they're expensive. They're really expensive. And, and, and it's, it's not like you charge them during the, that, that period where you notice where they go negative and they're charging. You can't rely on that battery to be available 24 hours, right? It, it, it's going to be depleted. You got to recharge it again and deplete it. And if you have a period of like bad weather or you have a lot of smoke in the air or that, you're going to have an issue. Right? That's the sourcing, right? And you, but we still, I still... I'm confident that we have enough uh, of a generation of resources to be able to supply a demand. My concern is getting it to the different, uh, getting it to the consumer. Uh, the infrastructure is just, it's just not where it should be. The transmission lines need to be expanded. And now my concern is the distribution system, which I showed in one of those diagrams before, very simplified. Distribution systems are, I don't think they're equipped to handle power going back the other direction. A, if so, if you have a lot of distributed resources, meaning solar and batteries at each house, for example, that's great, but it may not be able to handle all that power going back up, going back upstream, reversing the flow. That's tr tr traditionally been radio from the top to the bottom. That's one problem. 
uh, that's going to cause a whole bunch of other voltage issues and frequency issues that we won't, we won't even get into here because that's a whole lecture in itself. There will be issues, technical issues, yes. that will affect the ability of, of the providers to provide. No? Absolutely, absolutely. Just think of a, I, when I measure, for example, we have a Tesla and we, and we plug it in and when it's charging, it's the, it feels like you're, you're drawing 30 amps, 28, 30 amps. That feels like a, a electric dryer. You're running a dryer for four or five hours, basically, or two hours in some cars, right? So every everybody is, is gets home, they plug in their car to charge the moment they get home from work. Now that demand is is like everybody all of a sudden turns on their oven or turns on their dryer all at once. It's going to put a lot of strain on the system, right? Which is why most utilities now have what they call off-peak charging, where they stagger everybody. And, you know, you have 16 hours to charge your car. It just takes about two hours to charge your Tesla. So somewhere along, or they can they can reduce the amount of a trickle charge that takes eight hours as opposed to a a normal charge that takes about two hours. So they can manipulate that to benefit the system, but that's going to have its limits. That that will have its limits, and you're eventually going to be faced with a with a with a problem of having to do some a lot more of like. A, management and control of people's chargers. Now, a lot of utilities are already getting into that and they're incentivizing it, but not everybody is. So they have to agree on a protocol. That's a whole other problem, but, but you're absolutely yeah. right. That's going to be an issue. We, we're pretty good at analyzing this, this kind of uh, process and the ability of the system to handle the stress. Uh, we're pretty good at um, knowing what we, we need to have um, but but we we can't really control climate change. We we and, and and here's one question I want to put to you: It's not just heat and air conditioning. If if I take a given community, um, even a big community, and I put on lots of heat, lots of stress on the system, it's not just the air conditioning that has to pay the price. It's everything. People you know, change their lifestyles. They change what they do all day. Um, companies and individuals, they're all changing things. And when they change things, um, that's sometimes completely unpredictable. I mean, you know, you're a guy who probably could predict it. I got to say that. You could probably figure out how lifestyle changes would predict the demand. Um, but query, you know, do we know all that we need to know? Um, can we, you know, predict out a year or two or five years and, and then figure out uh, what climate change is going to be like in those years and how the world is going to turn and change in those years and then and then find a way. And, and I'm thinking that um, we, we, we know what we would have to do if the occasion arose, but can we in fact do it? Can we do it? in terms of the regulation, in terms of the existing technology, uh, in terms of, you know, political will, um, and in terms of people changing their lifestyle um, to change, you know, with the availability of the power. Um, so that's what I'm asking. Uh, what are we going to run into here? So ultimately, it, it's, I hate to say it, but it all revolves around economics. Right. And in a lot of cases, whether it's it, it, it's a corporate decision, you got to remember a lot of these technologies that the, everybody's thinking about, they're not they're not commercially viable yet. Right. Well, hydrogen, for example, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, brown hydrogen, a lot of them are not commercially viable. And most utilities, they do not care. They are source agnostic. They don't care where the power comes from. They just want to make sure they can get it move it and supply their customers, charge to them for the, you know, make sure the meters are turning and they can get their revenue and then and then they get their profits and then, then they can they can pay back their suppliers, right? Now the generators, they are the ones that are in the business of generating. And that ultimately there's economics behind it. Right? So it's a lot of money to, to to dedicate towards creating, for example, battery storage site. Uh, compare that to like a natural natural gas combined cycle unit, right? Where it's, where it has a lot more reliability. Well, that, that that also has a cost, right? And then of course you can't just plop it anywhere. You got to bring in the transmission lines. You got to do the siting and permitting, and that in itself is another hurdle and challenge. So uh, and then if we move on the consumer side, right? Look, okay. So what if we change consumers' habits? 100 degree Fahrenheit day, you're not going to get people to turn off their air conditioners. It, 
It's just unlikely. Unless you figure out a way where the, they can work from the pool in the shade, it's just not going to happen, right? So that that's a challenge in itself. People want to people want to be comfortable. So they'll be they'll be supportive while they can still be comfortable. Once they get a certain a certain level of discomfort, you you're pretty much guaranteed to lose all support. So that's the other issue there. So how far do you go? And then of course is a cost, right? I am I going to want to live somewhere where the energy is 38, 40 cents a kilowatt hour, or do, or worse, live, or do I want to set up a uh, an industrial operation in a place where, you know, because the residential, commercial, and then industrial all have different rates. So am I going to open up a factory, a big warehouse, a data center, somewhere where they're charging me a lot of money for, no, no, you're going to go somewhere where it's a lot cheaper, right? And that's that's what's happening as well. And in a lot of cases, that low generation cost is usually coincides with the type of resource they're running to generate that resource so all of that comes into play and at the end of the day economics plays a huge role in that particular sense yeah you've introduced a whole new idea to me and that is uh, energy migration that is migrant you know people leave for example the global south because they can't find food right um they can't live there and uh, a given company uh you know we, we've we've seen this in agriculture it needs a certain mm -hmm. amount of power and if it can't get that power at a certain figure, a certain cost, then it, it can't operate because it won't make a profit. It'll have to close its doors, so to speak. And so I can see a company, maybe a lot of companies, who, who can't get power at a rate that, that works on their you know, profit margins, um, leaving, saying, we can't do this. We either A, go out of business, or B, we move to a place where energy is cheaper. That may already be happening, but certainly it would happen it more going forward, don't you think? I've already seen it happen. I've seen it happen where where Florida has invited, has really, really courted a lot of companies that are work that are operating out of Texas. So they moved entire operations from Texas to Florida because Florida was giving them all kinds of stipends. And you know, that 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 changes has already been coming a long time. And and we're just looking at the economic aspect, right? There's another concern that's looming where you're also looking at the national security aspect where forget about cost. Now you're getting to the point where you don't have the reliability you're hoping for. So if you're deciding where well, I want to operate in a place where it's far more reliable. So you may be willing to maybe pay a little more for more reliable power. But if you're already at a point where you're expensive and you're unreliable, it's it's two strikes against that particular area. and They're really going to move especially when you have a, an industrial process that depends on constant, continuous, reliable power. And that's just, you know, a, a commercial operation. Now let's think of like national defense. It's a whole other problem there as well. Well, um, I think you should definitely approach that problem on another show mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's part of my paranoia anyway. We've seen all this hacking by nation states and their proxies. Yep. Um, and it's clear to me that if they wanted to bring down a utility company or a generator set, they could easily. The whole country, really. Yeah. And yeah. finally, you know, you have um, you have right here in Hawaii, you have all these um, all these generator sets and all this equipment that comes from far away, mm -hmm. which is dependent on the supply line and the, and the health of the um, you know economy and the industrial establishment in countries far away. Uh, geopolitics, if you will. Oh, yeah. So, for example, if I have a generator set, and I do uh, in the uh, in the in the army base in West Oahu, that comes from Finland, and Finland can't deliver parts, then that really creates a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, Germany and other places uh, around the world that that provided the original equipment needs to provide the parts and and probably the talent to come here and do it. And if that supply line is disrupted, I can't fix it. And then I and then it fails. So um, that that's kind of a, a national security of another kind. Uh, and certainly Hawaii security. I want to ask you one other thing before we close. And that is, what do I do? This is pretty technical. The average guy uh, watching your slideshow will say, hmm, well, how does that affect me in my, in my daily decision process yeah. how does that affect me in my prospects for having or not having sufficient energy to run my life um am i am i expected to give up some things should i change my life you alluded to that uh should i 
Um, should I change my source of energy? Should I go out and spend some bucks on on uh, rooftop solar and all the equipment that goes with that to make me independent off the grid, so to speak? Uh, or should I just wait for the utility to to you know develop uh, sustainable systems? Well, you, you you can take a, a measured approach to to kind of like spread out your spread out your risk. And believe it or not, most utilities right now are eager to get into a partnership with their with their consumers, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial. So I would start there. I would start by reaching out to your to your utilities, or rather, stop ignoring some of the uh, some of the outreach that some of the utilities are actually engaging in, because they're really really eager to get get buy in. And if you want to do solar, they more than likely can probably give you the best deal on a solar or roof solar installation, but they really are also gonna encourage you to get batteries because that combination is really the ideal solution. And then along with that, they will probably get you into a program where they control the charge and discharge. And, and really, because uh, for me, what I visualize in the future is, is a partnership where both of them benefit. If you have a storage of batteries and you have solar, you now are your own little generator and you can you can absorb excess power when the utility needs you to and you can sell them excess power when they need you to and guess what you can charge them both ways because for them they'll be probably happier to do that than it, than to go through the the hassle of building new, new lines building new generators going through the siting and permitting and all that nonsense so that partnership i think is the first step and really, in a place like Hawaii, it is like the, the perfect showcase. And you, you know how I feel about the whole uh, many years back when we tried to do that. Uh, we, they, they wanted to make, make it like the whole renewable energy showcase of the world. But, but you know, it's still possible to do that. But you still need to do it in partnership with the utilities. Well, it's a great case study from Hawaii, which, uh, you know, you should also or we should also discuss on perspectives mm -hmm. in energy. And that is... You get climate change, uh, which I consider the primary factor in the Maui fires, right. and and which which is still happening. There are still fires now, um, and uh, and then you you have you have these financial implications for mm -hmm. the utility. And now the utility is not in good shape. The utility you know can't do what it wants to do. The utility um, considers a bankruptcy or some kind of reorganization. Uh, gee whiz, and, and this ultimately affects the, the power that's available to the community. Um, and, it, you know, it, it wasn't their fault. I mean, I, some people would argue with that, but uh, I think that could happen somewhere else, no? Right. And so you have a whole scenario, just like the Hawaii scenario, mm -hmm. which leads to the inability of the utility to deliver. Right. Uh, this is very difficult because the risk is at so many levels. It's at it's the climate change prevention. It's at the technology, the, the sustainability, resilience. It's at the government level, and it's right. at the individual, you know, consumer ratepayer level. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, well, what would you say to somebody who is an individual ratepayer? What state of mind should that person have, and what action should that person take in the possibility that this kind of thing is going to happen again? Well, for me, my concern, of course, that always depends where you live, right? And, and where, where you are in the world, where you are in the nation. And, and Hawaii is has a certain unique position where, where it's all the islands are not interconnected. So you're subject to each individual island's network. And from a consumer in Hawaii at that point, my my view is that you're, you're paying a lot of money for energy as it is right now, right? Which is why I say, again, it, it's, it's really getting into like some partnership with the utilities. So right now for my concern is if a company like HECO, for example, is becomes an insolvent, who's going to come in and acquire that company? Because they're going to get it at, at like rock bottom prices perhaps, right? And then now all that, all that like steadfast anti-mainland approach by anybody can come in and buy it. Not just somebody from the mainland. It could be anybody from the world that come in and buy it. And now you have, you've lost all control at that point, right? And that's one of my that would be one of my concerns. So again, one of the steps to to keep that from happening is to again try and get into partnerships with the utilities. And that's probably probably be the best way to like benefit both of you, a mutually beneficial arrangement, and just have that relationship. Because at the end of the day, it's it's utilities are made up of people like you and I that they just work there, right? And, and most people, most employees of a utility are not there to, to squeeze a customer or try and rob them. They, ju they just want to make sure that, you know, 
power's on reliably, everybody goes home safely, and you're charging reasonable prices because in a regulated market, you're limited to what your profit can be. You know, you cannot make these exorbitant profits in an unregulated market. So people don't people don't know that. And, and that their first impression is they're charging exorbitant prices. Well, it costs a lot of money to operate in a, in, in a place like Hawaii. So just getting more educated and again, getting in partnership with the utilities is my, is my best advice. We live in interesting times. Mm -hmm. uh, this is only one of so many interesting so many. aspects of our interesting times. Guillermo, why don't you say goodbye because we're out of time, so to speak. Right. Well, you know, and time flies by when you and I are talking. So, again, thank you, everybody, for um, lending us this time to be able to watch this, this episode. It, it's an interesting uh, thing that's happening in our industry and in our society. And, and, and from a perspective of like a place like Hawaii is definitely the, the impact is a lot more acute. So again, thank you. If you have any questions or comments, please be sure to do, do that. Again, like and subscribe. And once again, thank you, Jay, for inviting us back on the show. Uh, I may be the host, but you know, you invited me back here again. So it's a pleasure to be here as always. So thank you for being my guest today. And uh, thank you all. Mm -hmm.